Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. Brought to you by the good people at Khaki, the Center for American Culture and Ideas. Ant, what's new and exciting in your world this week? One of our listeners, Gabriel Hansen, wrote us in response to something we said, or more specifically you said, you referred to the, what do you call the college-age generation? It's not Gen Z, is it? I think it is. Gen Z? I guess so. I wonder what comes next, by the way. I don't know. We're all out of letters. We probably got to go to Gen A. Gen AA, right, yeah. But there was never a Gen Y, was there? There was, I think, that's synonymous with millennials. Is that right? I think so, because I'm Gen X. As am I. Yeah, my kids are millennials, and then comes Gen Z. Yeah, so that would be Gen Y. Well, I'll get to whatever the complaint was. No, <laughs> Gabriel says, I'd like to bring to your attention as a member of the so-called participation trophy generation. I did say that. That I and my fellows aren't the ones who wanted participation trophies. It was our parents who wanted us to feel special. I remember as a student getting a participation trophy and feeling insulted because I hadn't earned anything. I like this guy already. Isn't he great? I lost the competition and so didn't want a blue ribbon just for being there. I thought it cheapened the rewards given to the people who won, and this is coming from a loser. I would ask you to consider that my generation didn't want participation trophies and that it was our parents who couldn't handle their children being losers rather than us who couldn't deal with our failures. Obviously, this is anecdotal, but I think it deserves consideration because participation trophies were forced on us, not requested by us. I actually don't think it's anecdotal. I think that what he says is unassailably correct. Having said that, I think the blame does go to the parents. And this was, generally speaking, boomers, not Gen X. Although I think it played into the Gen X generation as well. So yeah, the parents are absolutely to blame. But the ramifications all fall to the participation trophy generation. Right. Stipulated, parents are to blame. Now, who has to deal with the fallout? They do. Is that fair? No, that's not fair. But that's the reality of the situation. And we ended up with an entire generation, maybe a generation and a half of young people who don't know what it is to lose. And that's so dangerous. It's a very rude awakening because your mommy can only take care of you for so long. And Aunt, I remember like it was yesterday with angry mothers flooding into my university office to argue grades on behalf of their children. That leaves a mark. And later, when I was doing hiring at Strata, parents would routinely call me to try to work a better deal for their children. High school students are taken aback when I say to them that when I look at potential college students, I'm not interested in the high school student who graduated with a 4.0. What that tells me is this is someone who has not experienced failure and is going to experience it come college and may fall apart. Let me offer you a very gentle correction. A 4.0 is a thing of the past. I worry about students who graduate with a 4.6. Right, yeah. This push for participation trophies is not unlike, you hear it from time to time, this push for equity in pay, wherein everyone should be paid the same. I mean, yeah, you get the thing about genders and races and so forth, but this is a push for everyone, regardless of their job description, gets paid the same. And the problem there is you end up with a surplus of people looking to be employed in easier jobs, things that don't require much in the way of training or physical or mental effort, that kind of thing, and a shortage of people looking to be employed in more difficult jobs. And there is an example of this that you and I have both experienced in higher education. Colleges, particularly small colleges, and I was at one of them for some years early in my career, Colleges that insist on all faculty being paid the same end up overpaying professors in the humanities and underpaying professors in the sciences. Consequently, and this was the case at this small college I was at, they had PhDs from Harvard teaching literature and theology and philosophy. But when it came to the business school, they couldn't attract anyone with more than a master's level education to teach. We had exactly this problem at the American University of Iraq when I worked there. Every faculty was paid the same. Yeah. And it's exactly as you say, 
we were inundated with applications for English professors. We couldn't find business profs. Before anyone sends us hate mail about us implying that business and science is somehow harder than humanities, that's not my point here. My point is, when you pay everyone across the board the same, which is very similar to giving everyone the trophy, regardless of performance, you end up in a situation where you get less quality in the areas where it's more difficult to find workers. In higher education, that's in departments where the faculty have the alternative to go out into the private sector. Right. This is simple supply and demand, right? Yeah. And the two of us are a perfect example. You're an economist and I'm a political philosopher. Well, if I don't get a job at a university, I'm not working. If you don't get a job at a university, you've got a million other options. Yeah, in my case, it's actually easier to get a job outside of a university. Right, and those jobs pay more too, Yeah. right? So the way it all fleshes out is that your starting salary was literally twice mine. I never once thought that wasn't fair. Yeah, and not because it's what I do is any harder or because I'm any smarter or any of that thing, but simply because there are fewer people like me. Yeah, well, you're not any smarter. Let's just, <laughs> let's just get that out of the way right now. God's sake. Next topic. I've actually got some, I guess, good news. This also comes kind of, sort of, from a listener's email, although I can't remember who sent it. I had filed it away to talk about it later, but the news story was just too perfect. Somebody wanted us to talk about the price of meals. Thanksgiving meals. To oh, be that's right. I saw that. that. That was a great idea. It is a great idea. And it's one that I think we should get back to with proper attribution, maybe a couple of weeks down the road. But for now, the headline, average Thanksgiving dinner cost drops to $61 thanks to cheaper turkeys and cranberries. The prices are way down. And it's $61 for a meal for 10. Anywhere in that article, has the author attributed any of this to magnanimity or altruism on the part of the grocery stores because they certainly attributed the higher prices to selfishness. Nothing but greed, those filthy grocery magnates making their 3% profit. No, but they do, and I'll leave the article in the show notes. It's from Market Watch. It's actually a pretty solid article, as you often get from Market Watch. And it just lists all the various things that make up a Thanksgiving dinner and the average prices, whether they're up or whether they're down. Overall, the cost of the meal is down. That's great. Finally, we get to say something good about grocery prices. Hard to imagine 10 people at a Thanksgiving dinner in my house these days. As I segue into my new job, which is outside of academia, I'm having to delve much more deeply into certain things, one of them being inflation. In doing so in the past couple of days... What came to mind was the conspiracy theory I've heard that the Fed quotes core inflation to divert our attention from rising price of food and energy. Food and energy are not included in core inflation numbers. What I've discovered in digging deeply into the numbers is that food and energy, those two things, we may not be aware of it, but the prices fluctuate much more widely than other things. Wild fluctuations. Yeah, and so when the Fed's trying to get its head around what's inflation doing right now, it takes those two things out because basically they're just noise. And look, there are other measures that leave them in. Oh, yeah, there are. And certainly the Fed's not saying that this is the inflation rate that you, American householder, feel. What the Fed's doing is saying this is the inflation rate we're going to look at when we set policy because those other two things in the mix are way too noisy. I think the best news that I'm seeing here today is that a half pint of whipping cream is down 22.8%. Now, James, hang on a second here, because you notice this. I submit that people have a skewed idea of what inflation actually is because we have a tendency to notice when prices go up, but we tend not to notice when prices go down. Whipping cream is down 22.8%. Yeah, that's great. I can think of all kinds of things I want to do with all <laughs> kinds of whipping cream around the house. This is going to be great. Do you make your own whipped cream? I don't. I do. It's so good. Well, it sometimes gets made. I Not by me. Oh, one makes it in your household. <laughs> that's right. It does happen, but it happens <laughs> as if by magic. Some of these things are up. I don't think anything's up all that much. A 12-ounce bag of cranberries is down 18.3%. 
I don't know why anybody would care. The only cranberry sauce that matters is the kind that comes out of the can. Oh, my wife makes her own cranberry sauce, and what she'll do is wait till like the day or the week after Christmas, where the frozen cranberries go down to like 25 cents a bag, and she buys 20 of them and just puts them in the freezer. I can't understand why anybody would want something that doesn't come out of a can. Oh, fresh cranberry sauce is much better. That's crazy talk. But I will say this. The finest part of Thanksgiving and the part I look forward to year after year after year, and those who know me know that Thanksgiving is my favorite of all the holidays. You get together, you have dinner with each other, nobody expects a gift, and then you all go into your separate rooms, and people who don't know any better watch a parade and a dog show, and I watch football. But we circle back later in the evening, and this only works if you cook the stuffing the way it was meant to be cooked inside the bird. I don't care for these people who cook it on a stovetop in the name of food safety. I think they're just out of their minds. But we do it on the stovetop just because it's easier. God, you're Philistines. What the f*** is wrong with you people? (laughs) But you get yourself a nice white roll, and you load it up with a ton, and I mean a ton of mayonnaise. You slice off a bunch of that from the canned cranberry sauce. You pile a bunch of turkey on top of that. And then you put a bunch of stuffing on top of that, and you've got yourself the finest sandwich that has ever been made. This is the greatest part of Thanksgiving. It's the sandwiches after the fact. I leave it to people to enjoy their Thanksgivings. They don't need my exhortation to do that. I'm sure people are thinking this doesn't apply to Thanksgiving only. And not needing your exhortations. <laughs> See, I promised a listener that I would tone down the potty talk, and then you go and say something like that, and I have to tell you to go f*** yourself. Anyway, this brings us to the foolishness of the week. And while the foolishness of the week is often lighthearted and a carefree look at the stupidity politicians foist upon us, it's a little more serious this time. And it involves an online nude photo scam that is really getting the best of a lot of very young men, boys, I guess we would have to say. What happens, and it's almost always on Instagram, boys get these messages from really, really pretty girls. And, you know, most of them have never experienced that before and they get taken in by it immediately. And the girl will send a nude photo of herself and ask for one in return, which young boys are only too happy to send, only to find out that there was no young girl at the end of that conversation. Really, the whole thing is a scam. And the scammer says, send me money or I'm going to send this to all your friends yeah, or your yeah, parents yeah. or your teachers, right? There's always some pressure point that causes a young man to crumble when this sort of thing happens. And a couple of young boys have actually killed themselves over this nonsense. This is a serious thing. What you send out into the digital world stays out forever. So maybe there are some things that you just shouldn't do. Can you send pictures of yourself to anybody you want? Well, yes. Yes, you can. Should you? Yeah, maybe not for the parents out there, maybe a very gentle reminder of this fact to the young people in your life would be a pretty good idea. And I really do mean a gentle reminder. This isn't the kind of thing that people want to talk about. And it's certainly not the kind of conversation teenagers want to have with their parents. There's an added wrinkle to this that I think was a foolishness of the week, or whether it was or not, I don't recall. But we mentioned this, good Lord, maybe two years ago in an episode There was a young woman, high school student in Maryland, as I recall, who had the same thing happen to her. And she went to whoever it was, the authorities at the school, to report this. Next thing she knows, she's being charged with child pornography because she took pictures of herself. And she said in the article that we're reading from that, you know, she went in there as the victim, which she was, and all of a sudden discovered that they were treating her like the criminal exactly the wrong way to deal with it. And to add a little bit of levity to an otherwise brutally serious topic, I myself got an email from somebody not too terribly long ago saying that he had taken control of my webcam and had very compromising video footage of me. 
and he was going to send it to the world if I didn't send him $1,000 in Bitcoin. And I said, oh, well, I don't have any Bitcoin, but I've been meaning to take some footage and send it out to everybody I know. <laughs> could so you do it for me? <laughs> if, if you could get on that just as quickly as possible, I would be much obliged. And, and sadly, I never did hear back from this young man. For one-stop shopping for all things James and Ant, visit our website, wordsandnumbers.org. We give a special shout-out to our Patreon sponsors who help us keep the lights on. If you'd like to contribute, go to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers. We're here with Phil Magnus, who comes by every so often when things get really ridiculous. And things are, in fact, really ridiculous. Ant's had this bug for a while. He's been wanting to talk about this thing he calls academic fraud. And we immediately thought of you. We did. And and what brings this topic up now, because James and I have been talking about it for a number of years. James left academia and I'm now on my way out. I'm going into the banking sector starting at the end of this semester. So with both of us gone, and you were an academic, Phil, and you're out, this is a good opportunity for us to just speak frankly about what for years we've been referring to as fraud in higher education. There's like a million different kinds of fraud in higher education, and so I think you're going to have to be a little more specific. Let me start off the story here. And I noticed this going back to when I had my first faculty appointment straight out of graduate school. And I noticed it not at the undergraduate level, but at the MBA level. And this was, I was at a small, you know, four-year institution. And back in the day, this would have been just on the heels of the 1980s, 1990s, where the MBA became this big, powerful degree and the people on Wall Street were making tons of money. And so, All of a sudden, every small college across the country started up an MBA program. These things became cash cows because largely it was the employer who was paying for the employees to come and get this MBA degree, typically in the evenings. And this horrible bargain, (laughs) implicit bargain emerged between the institution and the students wherein the institution would go easy on the MBA students in exchange for the MBA students saying wonderful things about the institution such that the student's employer would then send more employees into the institution. What struck me here is, you know, I had come out of, as a graduate student, out of a research university. This is my first encounter with MBA students. I said, well, these are master's students. So, I started teaching them at a master's level. Boy, was that a mistake. I got called (laughs) down to the dean's office within the first week saying, look, you're asking too much of these students and so on and so forth. And it got to the point that I was beginning to suspect that these students were actually less prepared than my undergraduates. So I ran an experiment one year on the first day of class, so I didn't want to bias it. So first day of class, I haven't taught them anything. I have a group of freshmen in front of me and I have a group of first year MBA students. And I gave them both the same multiple choice test. Had to do with general business knowledge, economic theory, this kind of thing. Would you believe the undergraduates scored substantially higher than the master students, than the MBA students? And it was at that point that I said, look, this is fraud that's going on here. It doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> in fact, I'd even say if that same test to faculty in certain disciplines, and I think you may find a similar result. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But over the years, I've observed this kind of creep down into the undergraduate program. I was seeing it prior to COVID, and with COVID, it massively accelerated of year after year, the students who are coming in are less and less prepared. And by less and less prepared, I mean, just to give you an example, I can have college sophomores in front of me. And these are students who have come from good high schools. They've gotten into, you know, my institution, the one I'm about to leave, is a medium-sized university, not massively selective, but relatively selective. And the students that are in front of me, 
cannot do basic math. And by basic math, I mean stuff like multiplication and division when there are parentheses in the equation. <laughs> and these are business students. Excel skills, absolute zero. I mean to the point that I have to help explain how to start the program. Well, it's kind of like working with me. <laughs> <laughs> Except they don't swear as much. <laughs> We've had this problem for a long time, right? Young people are underprepared when they go to college. But here's the thing. They become more underprepared with each passing year. Well, they do. And, and I think what's going on is they're coming in underprepared, but we're not doing them any favors at the college level because the administration looks at this and says, look, we're having a shrinking student body because there's a fall off in the growth of the number of college students. And so we can't afford, particularly an institution that's driven by tuition rather than endowments, we can't afford for you faculty to be failing these students. And so the administration will do everything from what look like remedial high school programs for students who are currently enrolled as college students, all the way to putting overt pressure on faculty not to fail students. And so you've got no choice. You either run afoul of administration as an untenured faculty and get fired, or as a tenured faculty, in my case, and just throw up your arms and say, look, this is ridiculous. I'm not participating anymore. Or what happens is you end up failing out students to the tune of not having any students left. Yeah, it's a mess. I mean, I shake my head at it. One of the things that I see constantly in higher ed, and this is a, one of the points that we made in Cracks in the Ivory Tower, the book Jay Brennan and I wrote on basically some of these same issues is that a lot of the classroom time really isn't about conveying learning objectives. It's about creating work or creating income streams for the university. Yeah. We see this in gen ed classes. You know, students arrive at college classroom and they have this list of about a third of the time that they're spending there on a, any given degree is taking classes in a variety of subjects that are way outside of their majors, which is, you know, you, you think of this as kind of the liberal arts tradition, but there's a problem. There's a a hitch to it when they actually uh, administer tests to see if they learned anything in these gen ed classes that they're all required to take. Uh, the learning outcomes are basically non-existent. There's no change between the day that they arrived and the day they left. As a great defender of the liberal arts, I need to step in here at least for a second, <laughs> right? B because I don't doubt what you say is, is correct. I know it to be true. However, laying that at the feet of the liberal arts, I think, is unfair because what's actually happened is that these gen ed courses have been captured by a bunch of lunatics. Well, that's a big part of it. And you have to go take, you know, medieval lesbian poetry before you can graduate. And look, that's, that's just simply not a liberal arts education. Right. right. That's actually the opposite of a liberal arts education. That sort of nonsense gets you to stop thinking. Well, I think that's exactly the case. And you will get some of the syllabi out of these like writing composition 101 courses. And it's all about climate activism. Or it's about whatever the political fancy of the professor happens to be. The one thing they're not teaching in there is writing 101. And then students get to their other classes and the professors can throw their hands up and goes, wait a minute, didn't you just take a class to learn how to write? And they see the graded materials and, uh, and clearly students have not gained any skills. So really what I think it's become is a rent extraction mechanism yep. to shuffle funds to political activist disciplines. And, you know, I think you're absolutely right. Entire disciplines, especially in the humanities, many of the social sciences have been captured almost entirely by political activists, as in you look at the faculty uh, self-identification of their political leaning, and it's 80 or 90 percent of all faculty in the English department identify on the political left and most of them on the far left. I give you also sociology. Exactly. Anthropology, psychology, all of these. No shortage here. So how do you start to address this, right? Because, I mean, look, what happened in a nutshell was that old-time liberals, who I happen to love quite a lot, said things like, well, everybody should have a seat at the table. And then when it came to hire and the 60s radicals were on the market, they hired some. And then the 60s radicals came together and said, all points of view really ought not be on the table when we already know what the truth is. Let's hire more people just like us. And all of a sudden, it was like a cockroach infestation. You, everywhere you look, that's all you had. Well, yeah, it's an echo chamber. And then they take control of the journals. They take control of academic presses that specialize in their area. And next thing you know, the only research that's getting published is crazy Marxist interpretive dance poetry. 
Right. And people might say, well, don't read it. And that's great. But that's also how you get credentialed to keep your job. If you're not publishing on the flavor of the week, you're probably going to lose your job in the end. Yeah. That's not a great outcome for <laughs> anybody interested in the health of higher education. Yeah. So you got ideological echo chambers that have been set up in the research production mechanisms, ideological echo chambers and courses that aren't actually teaching skills that students are supposedly signing up for. Instead, they're teaching political activism. And it all comes together, basically, of the current situation that we have, which is rigor is declining, academic standards are declining. And now we're getting into the territory where academic fraud, which you just mentioned, is increasingly tolerated and sometimes even celebrated in the academy. Why don't you give us a couple examples of this sort of academic fraud? Because I know you've done some research on it. Yeah, quite a bit. I've actually kind of made uh, something of a name of, uh, for myself of going after instances of academic fraud that I found. One recent one that I had was uh, I discovered about a year ago, there's a uh, professor at Princeton University, very prominent history professor by the name of Kevin Cruz. And I was reading one of his books, and I noticed a passage in there. It was a quotation about Abraham Lincoln and the surrounding text around it. Something just stuck out about the passage. I started scratching my head. I said, I think I've read that sentence before, or that paragraph before, and did a little bit of digging and found uh, a very obscure article uh, that had the same quotation, the same uh, phrasing in it. And he had basically ripped off that article, basically plagiarized it. But it was a small instance. Then I started digging a little bit deeper. And I found more and more examples of basically outright cut and paste plagiarism through uh, about 20 years of his career. And it went all the way back to his doctoral dissertation. Uh, and the doctoral dissertation was the real breakthrough. It was a dissertation about race relations in 1960s Atlanta. And he had cut and paste in the opening chapter a paragraph from a book that had been recently published on Detroit. And he switches out the city's name. So Atlanta becomes, or Detroit becomes Atlanta, but otherwise it's the exact same paragraph, cut and paste, almost verbatim. Surely he was fired for this. <laughs> Quite the opposite. So Princeton University investigates, and they issue a report that basically says that this was accidental cutting and pasting. Uh, <laughs> his finger, his finger slipped. <laughs> his finger slipped, which is also fascinating, but you can pull up Princeton University's honor code for students. And right there in the honor code, it says there is no such thing as accidental plagiarism, I'm paraphrasing here. Wow. They basically will not accept that excuse if a student brought it to them and was accused of plagiarism. And, and here they're just kind of hand-waving it away and letting this professor off. Let's back up just a second here, because when I was a professor, and I was a professor for many years, it was a job that I actually loved quite a lot, mostly. I was a stickler for academic integrity. I mean, a real stickler for academic integrity. Everything was checked and people were held to standards. And you would think that of the times I caught people plagiarizing, and these are egregious examples of plagiarism, and I'm talking over what, 20 years or so, I probably caught a couple hundred people. Surely, most of them were expelled, right? Well, no, actually, none of them were expelled. Even when I caught some for multiple instances at one college I taught at, St. Vincent College, Anthony's alma mater, the rule was if you got caught three times plagiarizing, you would be expelled. Well, I caught people myself three times, and they were not <laughs> plagiarized. And I would bring this to the attention of a dean, and the dean told me, this is a verbatim quote, just get them through. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Meaning lower the grade a little bit, pass them, and then none of us have to deal with this again, which I think makes Anthony's point from earlier exactly spot on, right? Because this was happening in the early 2000s. Yeah. 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 I had a similar situation. It wasn't plagiarism, but it was a situation where I was teaching a reading course. We're all doing readings from historical economists, and the class itself was seminar type. So all we do is discuss these readings. And one student was failing and came to me, talked about it, and said, look, I just didn't have time to do any of the readings. And by any of them, I mean any of them. She read none of the stuff throughout the entire semester. And so, of course, I failed her. She goes and complains to the dean. The dean changes her grade to passing. 
This is a student who admitted to me she had done zero of the work for the semester. The dean changed the grade because it's a small college and they could not afford to lose that student's tuition. Well, losing even one is a real problem. Well, it's even more perverse than that because who tends to pay full tuition? It's the poorer students. The better students have academic scholarships. So everywhere we look, from the delivery of the classes to the students who receive those classes to the research which informs those classes, we literally have intractable problems. And no mechanism to do anything about it. Another recent example that um, I encountered, there's a historian by the name of Nancy McLean. And if anyone's read my work, they have um, known that we have clashed. Calling Nancy McLean a historian is incredibly generous. That is also the case. She's a political activist, and she's at an elite university. She's at Duke University. And I first encountered her when uh, she wrote this horrible book, Democracy in Chains, in 2017. And I basically went through and dissected it and found all these instances of her misusing sources, making stuff up out of thin air. But one thing she really likes to do is to take quotations, so historical document quotations, and alter them and chop off parts of the sentences to change their meaning. Um, there's actually an ac academic term for this. It's called contextomy. Uh, so there's, there's your obscure word of the day. Contextomy is taking a sentence, quoting it, and then excerpting off the end of it that alters the meaning or taking out words to change the meaning. And McLean did this all over the place in Democracy in Chains and came under fire for it. Charles Beard did this in his analysis of Federalist 10 years and years and years ago. There's nothing new under the sun, right? Exactly. And Beard did it for political purposes, and McLean does it for political purposes. Exactly. It's incredibly disingenuous. Yeah, it misleads the reader because, you know, your research is supposed to be replicable and you're supposed to be able to check those sources. So I found another instance of this in an article that McLean wrote earlier this year. And I noticed this article was in a fairly obscure journal called the History of Economics Review. But the article attacked me directly. It was basically her response to me uh, because I had uh, written critical things about her earlier book. But she is trying to make the case that this economist, uh, William H. Hutt, who's a South African economist, made his name by opposing apartheid. So her thesis is she's trying to claim that Hutt was actually a, like a secret white supremacist. And part of the way that she did this is she found a quote in his book where he is critiquing the white Afrikaner population of South Africa for hypocrisy. These are mostly the descendants of Dutch settlers who had complained in the early 20th century about how the British colonial agents had discriminated against them. And then they turn around and they discriminate against black Africans by imposing the apartheid regime. So Hutt has this harsh condemnation of them. McLean engages in contextomy. She takes the quotation, chops out the section where he refers to the Afrikaners, and passes it off in her paper as if he's attacking Black Africans, the victims of apartheid. And she cites this as supposedly the proof that uh, he was a secret white supremacist. I find this working with Art Carden and uh, Ilya Muratashvili. We were both compiling together all these examples for an article, a response to her, and we discover that she's just manipulated this quotation. So what did we do? Like responsible academics, we brought it to the attention of the journal editor. And the journal editor reviews it, basically sends us through multiple rounds, uh, leading us on on what he claims is peer review. And then ultimately earlier this week, he responds, says, well, I'm just not going to publish any response to them. So I pressed him further on this and said, well, wait a minute, here are the quotes side by side. You can clearly see that she's misrepresenting the quote. And he just kind of blew me off, waved it aside and says, well, Part of historical scholarship is every quotation is taken out of context, and you're just interpreting it differently than she is. Wow. With a hot load of nonsense right there. Wow. Exactly. He should be ashamed of himself. Yeah. Uh, he should resign as editor of this journal because it's unbecoming of him. He'll undoubtedly receive an award of some kind. Probably. And, and McLean received awards for her books. For example, Gabriel Zuckman, Thomas Piketty's frequent co author, 2019. He published a data set that purported to show that the rich pay a lower income tax rate than the rest of us. Uh, you know, there's made headlines. Joe Biden quotes it almost every week now. It was all over the New York Times. And his data set was provided to the New York Times without proper peer review. And I compared it to an older data set that he had published a few months earlier and found that the two did not match up. He had done something that changed his numbers in between. Uh, to make the story fit the political narrative that he wanted to do. 
I called attention to it, wrote a couple pieces on it, tweeted it out to the world. Larry Summers picked it up and noticed the uh, Twitter debate and basically called him out in a uh, public forum a few weeks later at Harvard. Zuckman did face a few professional repercussions. Reportedly, he was denied a job at Harvard as a result of Summers basically bringing this out about him. But then two or three years later, he's awarded the AEA's John Bates Clark Medal. Yeah, that's a prestigious award. Very prestigious award. And he'd basically been caught manipulating his data to make it fit this political narrative that Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren are using to justify tax raises. And someone listening might rightly ask, well, why doesn't a better college come about that doesn't do this sort of thing? And it's one of the secrets of academia, I guess, that it's actually a protected, I guess oligopoly is a better word, but it's a protected industry. Absolutely. A college or university doesn't have to be accredited, but without accreditation, your students are not eligible for federal financial aid. Your students who graduate cannot take their degree and now go to a graduate school and get admitted because the graduate school won't recognize this degree from an unaccredited institution. And who does the accrediting? It's the universities themselves. They'll send their higher administrators who sit on this accrediting body that turn around and accredit other institutions. They're self-protecting in that fashion. Then we come to your story about the journals. And how do you become a journal editor? Largely speaking, you need a PhD. But to get a PhD, it's got to come from what? An accredited institution. (laughs) Competition is just not possible here. Essentially, it's cardinalized and it's cardinalized in a very ideological way. They all seem to converge on the same set of standards, and those standards are collusively supportive of Department of Education regulations. And increasingly, they're uh, they're putting pressure on politicizing aspects of accreditation. But, you know, I, I'm waiting for one of these days when a major accreditor announces that a university must have a DEI officer in place in order to retain its accreditation. We're, we're, we're around the corner from that. That's days away, not years away. I'm sorry, a DEI officer, diversity, what? Equity and inclusion, which are basically political commissars that tell a university, you know, you have to support a very specific version of racial politics Uh, comes from the far left. And you have to uh, hire an army of administrators that supposedly monitor the diversity situation on campus. And the latest thing they've been doing is they've been requiring faculty applicants for jobs to submit DEI statements, basically yes. pledging fidelity to critical race theory in order to even be eligible for an interview. And then you have administrators step in and they use the DEI statement as a screening mechanism to keep out anyone who has the wrong viewpoints. Yes. And I've seen these questions. They're literally asking, how would you incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion into your course material? If you're teaching chemistry, I, what are you supposed <laughs> to do there? <laughs> It's hard enough with economics, right? But God, we use the term fraud. You use the term fraud. Raised this conversation with a friend of all of ours, uh, Clark Neely, a couple of years ago. And he said, well, fraud isn't the right term because there's no contractual relationship here. There's no contractual obligation. For any budding lawyers out there, I want to throw out something that might be useful. And that is... For the past, good Lord, maybe two decades, universities have been doing two things. One, they've been referring to the class syllabus as a contract between the professor and the students, not only overtly referring to it as a contract, but actually employing it. If there's some disagreement that goes to the dean between a student and the faculty member, the dean's going to ask, what does the syllabus say? Two, Universities are requiring now that faculty write their syllabi in particular ways that use particular language. And the particular language goes like this. By the end of this course, the student will be able to. And then you list out whatever the seven or ten big things a student should be able to do. Now, if indeed... The university itself is going to say that's a contract, and that contract says by the end of the course, the student will be able to do the following things. And if indeed a student who passes that course can't do those things, that seems to me to be fraud, black and white. 
or if the syllabus says plagiarism will be punished by failure in the course. Yeah. And many of them require that, but they don't abide by their own policies. Just to give our listeners an idea of how ridiculous this has gotten, Anthony's talking about a thing in the industry called learning outcomes. There are also learning objectives, and these are two completely different things. You would have to ask a bureaucrat how and why that's the case. I've been in the industry for two and a half decades, and I still don't know. I was prone to asking the difference when I was ordered to include these nonsensical things into my syllabi. And nobody ever did provide me with any clarity on the matter. But in the last place I worked, the University of Arizona, I was mandated to include all kinds of language in my syllabi. It ended up being, I think, nine pages worth of various things that, frankly, I never had anything to do with. It was just administrative nonsense. A good syllabus is two and a half pages tops. And guess how many students read all nine of those pages? Zero. Yeah. 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 The ones who failed the class, they turned into defense attorneys with those nine pages. They would go looking for anything in there right. to bring to a dean. But by then, I just kind of waved my hands and said, well, you do what you're going to do. Grades changed out. You have journal editors that bypass their own rules and standards. You have faculty that are uh, are lit off the hook for blatantly misrepresenting data, quotes, facts, whatever you name it. And there does seem to be a common theme, at least on the research side, and that is that if the professor is touting a certain political line, promoting certain opinions, certain forms of activism in the classroom, they're basically untouchable. Now, if someone on the other side of the debate even did a minor instance of plagiarism, you can expect there'd probably be an inquiry at the university. They'd, They'd be gone. The double standards in academia are are profound. They seem to get worse the higher up you go to the more elite institutions. Yep, I think that's exactly right. And when you take a step back and really look at it, the whole thing might be a lost cause at this point. Yeah. I, I really do think that that might be true. We see people right now trying to start a new university down in Austin, Texas. And I, I read somewhere today, and this was astonishing to me, yeah. that this is the first private university that anybody's been able to start in 130 years. Can that be right? Don't know the exact numbers. I do know that in the 19th century, you can watch universities and colleges just spring up all over the country as the Western migration is occurring. It's like every little town in the middle of rural Ohio has a university in it. 20, 30 years prior to the Civil War on, it was a tremendous time for the growth of colleges and universities. Now, I question the 130-year number because I know there's a bunch of Christian colleges that are, are relatively new. And I guess they're just not including them for whatever categorical reason they have. I take the point, though, that it's incredibly difficult to start a college. And Ant's point a while back that this is just generally a guild system. Yeah, basically. That keeps all competition as far away as it possibly can. Well, yeah. What's going to be the saving grace? And you you can hear the rumblings of it already. Our employers. As employers come to realize that a college degree anymore really doesn't mean anything, they're going to stop requiring college degrees. They're going to stop elevating candidates because they have college degrees. And when that happens, students are going to be far less interested in coming to college. Or alternatively, they'll be interested in those new unaccredited colleges that don't care about playing the guild game. They just want to deliver a quality education. For any rich people out there, the three of us would like to start one of those any day, so you'd be in touch. But and on that same line, I think with the recent ugliness in Israel and the protests that sprung up, a lot of U.S. employers took a look at the students who were protesting, what they were protesting, the language they were using at their universities, and decided right then that they weren't going to hire anybody from those universities anymore. Yeah, And these were elite universities. Oh, yeah. It's like Penn and Harvard lost multi-million dollar donations. And that's fascinating, right? That's the kind of thing that could actually reverberate. So I do see things working in the opposite direction, but they're coming in from very strange quarters. And I think COVID accelerated all of this. This decline that I've been observing in student quality for a couple of decades increased tenfold with COVID. I hear the same thing from high school 
teachers who say that, look, they just can't deliver the quality of education they did before because the students in front of them who are now, I guess, high school juniors and seniors don't have the skill set to be juniors and seniors. But what do you do? You can't fail the entire class. So they send them off. And where they send them off to? Well, to college. I can imagine that we probably have 10, 15 years in front of us just to get back to the rate of decline we were at prior to COVID. Right. All that is flowing through the entire system. And on top of it, COVID really brought the political crazy of academia to the forefront, uh, yeah. brought the activist departments front and center. You know, James just mentioned the whole thing on the, the Israel-Palestine thing. Saw a really interesting set of data just this afternoon. Someone had tallied up the departments that the signers of this basically pro-Hamas letter at an elite university were from and then compared it to a competing letter that condemned the terrorism. And the pro-Hamas voices were all concentrated in the English department, the history department, philosophy department, all the humanities. And the sane part of the university, it was the business school, it was the STEM disciplines, and it was the economics department. Yeah, which is exactly how it splits amongst the faculty. Yeah, we should be careful here because when I say it splits, I don't mean that what you mentioned, business and STEM and economics are on the right in universities. No, they, not at they, all. They are what the rest of the population would call left. They just yes. aren't extreme left. Right, right. And you find that even the opposition voices in the university are soft left voices. Yeah. yeah. So they don't oppose very often. And let me underline something here that one or the other of you said. I think diversity in education is a wonderful thing, particularly and maybe solely when it comes to diversity of ideas. So by all means, have Marxists, have leftists, have far leftists at a university but also have the other side so that students can see a broad scope of ideas. And that is not what they're getting. Exactly. They're, Marxists are definitely oversupplied in the university system. Mm -hmm. This is also a trend that's it's gotten significantly worse in the last 40 years or so. So if you go back to the 1960s, there were uh, always surveys that asked the faculty, are you the left, the right, the middle? Very simplistic surveys, but it goes to the range of the spectrum. And from the 60s, 70s through about the 1980s, there was always a plurality on the left, but there were sizable conservative and moderate factions in the middle of that. So it'd be like 45% is on the left, and then the remainder is split about evenly between conservatives and moderates. But since about the late 1990s, conservatives and moderates have been in absolute decline, and mm -hmm. faculty on the left just skyrocketing. So now, uh, like the most recent survey, I think goes through 2019, and it estimates that about 60% of all university faculty identify on the left, only 12% identify on the right. And there's a little bit of a, a mixture in the middle uh, that identify as moderates, but it's an unprecedented, sharp leftward shift. And I think we're only just now starting to realize some of the repercussions of that. To be clear, the repercussions are everywhere. They're at the yeah. faculty level, the student level, and the research level, and at the institutional level. And, yeah. and here we sit. And it's no accident that what Anthony calls academic fraud, I, I think I agree, became an issue exactly as this unfolded. Right. There's no competing ideas to keep some of these fringe ideologies in check. If you submit your article to a journal that's only an echo chamber of other Marxists, they aren't going to scrutinize it. It tells the same story that they expect and they want to hear, and that's how Nancy McLean can lie about quotations. Uh, that's how Gabriel Zuckman can fabricate data and not get called on it. Let's be clear. The final output of this entire system is a group of students who rely solely on their feelings instead of thoughts and observations and facts and you know these sorts of things that a good academic would pay attention to and they become the next generation of academics right right so it gets worse every generation and that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Until next time, be sure to follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. Join Words and Numbers Backstage, the Facebook group where the conversation continues, and send us email, wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. Until next week, try to be nice to one person. One person who doesn't deserve it. Just one. And who knows, it may turn into a trend. Give it a shot. You might feel good about yourself. You could say you tried.
You tried. That's right. Till next week. Can't take it easy. See you next week, James. 